Cool. So today we're going to be talking about monorepos. As we said, any size of monorepo fits all organizations. So today we're going to be talking about a not so obvious way to make your teams or organizations more effective. There's already a ton of content about out there about choosing the correct framework for your use case, the best editor plugins to make the most of your time during the workday, and even ways to name your individual files. What we're interested in is even more high level. What is the best way to organize your repositories? Well, first a bit of background on me. My name is Alton Stocker, and I'm a software engineer at Narwhal. We maintain the open source build tool NX, which helps your organization scale its development, as well as provide consulting services to some of the world's largest companies. In my free time, you can find me flying my drone, building keyboards, or trying to hike places that I'm probably not prepared for. As we go through the talk, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me on Twitter at StockAlton. So what is the best way to organize our repositories? Well, how do we define best? It's probably something that increases developer collaboration. We'd probably like to see an increase in productivity too. That's always helpful. And finally, let's try and remove as much overhead from the development process as possible. So what can you use that has all of these traits? If you remember the title slide, you can probably predict the answer. Monorepos. Now, for those who are already aware of monorepos, I know there are a lot of opinions on this topic, so stay with me for the next 20 minutes. For those of you who are unfamiliar, let's go to our old friend Wikipedia for a definition. In version control systems, a monorepo, mono meaning single, and repo being short for repository, is a software development strategy where code for many projects is stored in the same repository. So instead of having a unique repository for every one of your front ends or services, these projects can live together in harmony. This kind of structure can come with a variety of benefits that we'll go over in a bit. Things like ease of refactoring, greater flexibility and collaboration, and improved integration experience. To be clear, we are specifically not talking about monolithic applications. While all of your code is stored in the same repository for a mono repo, all of the individual projects within should be able to be run, built, and tested in isolation, the same as if they had their own repository. As we start looking at the impacts of adopting such a strategy for a code organization, I'd like to introduce the organization size pyramid. We'll be using this to talk about how differently sized organizations may gain benefits from adopting a monorepo structure. The three sections of the pyramid represent the three sizes of engineering teams. Keep in mind that these are just rough divides and not meant to assert that organizations will receive no benefit if they are over or under a certain size. So we've got small teams, which I'll define as one to 15 people. This team might be maintaining a small focused product or could be a startup in the early phases of scaling. Then we have medium sized teams, which range from 15 to 70 to 100 people. This team is likely a bit more established and has grown to a size where you might have whole teams doing foundation work for elements shared throughout projects. Finally, large teams have more than 100 people. Each of these sizes will have a unique take on which benefits are the most applicable to them. Let's start looking at those. Now, we are at JavaScript day, so I'll be framing the benefits in that context, but all of the following apply to basically any programming language you'd like. With that in mind, let's talk about code reuse. Now, the most common option for code reuse when your organization has multiple repositories is packaging and distributing through NPM, either publicly or on a private registry. There are some pretty severe pain points that come from this approach. The first is that it takes multiple commits to get any changes in. Let's take the most simple case, an update to a library that doesn't require a code change in a dependent app. In this best case scenario, a developer needs to make and test their changes, publish the library, update the version in the consuming or dependent apps, which this step can begin to take considerably longer if there are multiple apps that need to be updated, and then commit the changes to the dependent apps. In contrast, a monorepo structure, the flow is much more straightforward, especially if our projects are using TypeScript. Why is this? Well, TypeScript supports path aliases. 
path aliases let us replace long, annoying to remember relative paths with shorter, easier to remember nicknames. These are so helpful to developer experience that you might already be using them, even if your organization currently uses multiple repositories. So how does this help with our code reuse? Well, we can use path aliases to reference our library code as if it were packaged and distributed on NPM, but without having to package and distribute it before use. Most of the time, whatever framework we are using will be able to help build our package code in with the app build process, meaning no packaging overhead. Our changes can propagate instantly. If you're wise with the tooling you select, you can even get this feature to work with live reload development servers. So what does our process look like when we combine a monorepo structure with path aliases? Well, you make and test your change in a library, and then you're immediately able to consume the change in the dependent apps. And then you commit the changes to both the library and affected apps in a single go. All we've done here is remove the distribution portion of the process, but that alone is a huge time saver. In my own experience, locally installing from files or using tools like NPM link are both slow and headache inducing. So this is already a win, but wait, now our previously distributed package exists inside of a monorepo. Does that mean it's only accessible in that context? Well, no. Remember, a key part of our definition of monorepo is allowing all projects to function as if they were in their own repos. That means you can incrementally migrate into a monorepo structure and still gain the benefits we just talked about. So how do our engineering teams feel about this? Well, for a small team, if you're shipping packages internally, this will likely be quite a large win. Most developers are probably touching this code, which, remove, which means removing overhead will have a much larger impact on day-to-day -day productivity. For medium or larger teams, especially those that have reached the size where they have a foundation or core library sub team, the difference may not be as noticeable because the fewer team members would have been taking part in this process. So the intro of this talk mentioned benefits though, plural. So what else can monorepos do for us? Monorepos also allow us to enforce a single version policy, but what does that mean? Simply put, the single version policy means that all of our projects are going to be on the same version for dependencies. Dependencies, especially in NPM, are not a ton of fun to deal with. Enforcing a single version means that it's easy for you and your teams to verify that all of your projects and shared packages will continue to work together. You no longer need to worry about whether the random utility library you got is going to obey semantic versions, or if a minor version update in your framework will cause difficult to be debug issues and consuming apps. Everything is consistent. Now, this is definitely one of the more controversial aspects of monorepo style development. And one of the common complaints comes from teams that would like to switch to such a structure, but find single versions infeasible. This is normally due to organizational pressures that don't give their teams enough time or resources to keep their projects up to date. Fortunately, if your team is in this position, not all hope is lost. Not only are there a variety of tools out there for administering a monorepo, some of them are not opinionated about whether or not you maintain a single version policy. It's also possible to start only new projects in a monorepo, then slowly migrate in legacy projects as resources allow. I've had great success with the second approach. Apologies. I've had great uh, success with the second approach at a previous company, and taking this approach can help iron out any kinks in your process before dropping all of your engineers in. For our organization size lens, we'll take a look at ease of implementation and overall benefit from keeping our dependency versions consistent. Smaller teams will likely have an easier time implementing a single version policy simply because it's less likely that any of the projects under their control have diverged significantly from what is currently being used. Medium-sized teams may struggle slightly more, since more people involved on a project means more opportunities for changes. Large teams will have the most difficulty adapting to a change like this, simply due to scale. The larger your team, the easier it will be to take an incremental approach to single version policies. Overall benefit for all three team sizes, in my opinion, is large. For small scaling teams, it is easy for developers to context switch to a different project that uses the exact same version as their primary project. 
For medium and large teams, the interactions between commonly shared code are not, no longer as brittle. In fact, they shouldn't be brittle at all, which leads us into yet another benefit of monorepos, ease of integration. The benefits we've talked about so far have been mostly independent of tooling, but like most things in the JavaScript world, your experience can be vastly different depending on what software you have available to assist you. So all of our projects live in the same repository in a monorepo structure. That means our integration steps are going to take a huge amount of time, right? After all, there's so much code in a monorepo, uh, so much more code in a monorepo than in a traditional repository, that only makes sense. And again, this can be the case, but there are tools out there that solve this problem. If all of our code lives together, which it does, and we can see which code is importing other code, which we can, that gives us a ton of previously unavailable power in the area of static code analysis. Suddenly, we are able to build a connected graph of all of the dependencies within our code. This is a useful feature by itself. Sometimes you want to know the impact of making a change to a part of your code base. But consider what else this knowledge allows us to do. We can now choose to run our integration only on the parts of the code that are impacted by a change. The impact this has is huge. Let's say your organization takes a micro front ends approach and has tens of apps, or three to four, because that's all I can fit on a slide. If you make a localized change, why would you want to waste developer time or organization money running builds for apps that aren't affected? Not only are you empowered to do less work, you're actually doing the bare minimum work required to guarantee your project is safe. As a developer, this is appealing because waiting for CI checks isn't something I look forward to. If I run an organization, this is doubly appealing because developer time is not cheap and I'll take any increase in productivity that I can get. The knowledge of which projects were affected by which code changes is also hugely valuable to organizations of all sizes. No matter the size of your organization, faster, accurate integration will always be a massive advantage. This kind of benefit scales with the kind of organization you have and the number of projects you have. So small teams will see an improvement, but for larger teams, this can be a complete game changer. Finally, in the same vein, the combination of code being together with the opportunity for great tooling means that refactoring is easier than ever. Imagine you have a package that's gotten too bloated that you'd like to split into two. In a normal repository setup, you would have to spin up another new repository, get all the boilerplate created, possibly set up CI, and make sure that everything publishes correctly. This sounds like a lot of steps. In a monorepo setup with the same tooling we just talked about, this becomes considerably easier. Now you can essentially copy paste your code into a new subdirectory, set up a new path alias like we talked about earlier, switch your imports, and be done. Not to mention that our tooling can detect that there were no changes to project three, so only projects one and two would even need to be rebuilt. There's even more possibilities involved with refactors because using a tool like ESLint, you can write custom rules that run in your repo to enforce refactors like this over time. Not to mention that this type of change can be made 100% safely with this kind of effective tooling. So we've gone over a variety of high impact benefits that can come by adopting a monorepo structure, but there are some trade-offs to consider. We've already gone over these some of, we've already gone over some of these briefly but we can take a deeper look. The first is the overhead related to adopting a monorepo. There are a few strategies to minimize this impact, but they have pros and cons. Your organization could choose to put only new projects into your monorepo and migrate legacy code in as time permits. This is not the easiest approach, um, but obviously does not allow for the full benefits of the structure to be seen for as long as it takes for that repo to reach critical mass. Another st strategy is similar, but subtly different. Instead of trying to achieve a single monorepo for your organization, you can instead try to combine existing projects where it makes sense to have multiple monorepos. There's nothing wrong with this approach. Um, and you will see the same benefits we've spoken about, but to a lesser degree. Now, the second trade-off is the impact on your release flow. The most common branching structure for a monorepo is trunk-based which many other people have provided more in-depth and detailed explanations of than I can. The gist is 
using a single branch that all commits get merged into. Combining this with good CI checks allows your team to make sure that all of the code at a given commit works together. However, this can be a bit of a change from something like a Git flow and can mean retraining um, and adjustment in your team's workflow. Handling releases for multiple apps in the same repository is something that everyone's organization will also handle differently. But in general, you have two choices, tags or release branches. My experience has been that release branches are better because if you need to make a hotfix for some issue that wasn't caught in CI, uh, you don't need to worry about unfinished or work in progress features leaking into your release artifacts. Finally, your team will have to handle access control a bit differently. The good news is that every major version control provider already has ways to handle this through permissioned reviewers. On large teams, it's important to make sure that people that lack context in new areas of the code are limited in the types of changes they can make. In a traditional repository setup, this could be handled by access to the repository as a whole. In a mono repo, you'll have to implement something like GitHub's code owners uh, to handle this. This allows for directory or even file level control when it comes time to getting pull requests or merge requests approvals. Now, before we wrap up, we'll get into our final bit. We've talked a lot about the importance of tooling and how it can really take the mono repo experience to the next level. There are quite a few options out there that are open source and ready to be used. A few that immediately come to mind are Bazel, Lerna, Rush, and my personal favorite, NX. Now, I am biased towards NX, but I think it's for good reason. NX provides all of the necessary parts of the tooling that we just talked about without needing a ton of knowledge about configuration. Out of the box, it supports creating a dependency graph from your code, um, allows you to enforce constraints on which projects and packages can import from each other, and you can use Git to determine which of your projects are affected by code changes. It's also got a wide variety of framework support out of the box with frameworks like Angular, Nest.js, Next.js, as well as a highly extensible dev kit that you can use to add support for any language. For proof, we use Kotlin in our internal mono repo at Narwhal, and we have a variety of well-supported and maintained community plugins from Vue to .NET to Golang. You can check out NX by visiting the site at nx.dev. Now, this talk isn't meant to be an advertisement, so do your own research and pick the tool that works best for you. But I think that if you're primarily interested in JavaScript, NX will be at the top of your list. So we've gone over my mono repos as a high level concept and talked about their benefits. It's a structure that shouldn't be ignored with its high potential for increased collaboration, excellent integration abilities and dependency solutions. We've taken a look at how many of those benefits uh, or, or how each of those benefits may benefit organizations of varying sizes, as well as address some of the common problems teams run into when moving into monorepos. I hope that this has uh, gotten you excited about the way you structure your code as a productivity enhancer, and that we've addressed some of the concerns you might have had about implementation. Now, we've got the Q&A coming up, and I'm also open to fielding questions on Twitter, at Stock Alton. So thanks so much for watching, and have a great rest of your day. I'll see you in the Q&A.